Okay, thank you everyone. It's, it's very nice to see so many people just before lunch. So thank you for coming. Um, let's just jump in. We will be talking about today the past, present, and future of Tetragon. What was the first production use case? Uh, what was the main security challenge? What were the first and then uh, later stage customers? What are the lessons we learned and where are we heading? Uh, my name is Natalia Ivanko. I'm a product manager for runtime security at Isovalent, and here is with me John, um, Tetragon lead, Cilium maintainer, and principal engineer at Isovalent. So how many of you heard about Tetragon? Raise up your hands. All right, pretty cool. That's quite a lot of people. I will still do a quick intro in a couple of slides. So Tetragon basically an eBPF-based runtime security observability and enforcement agent. So it can run on top of any Linux operating system in case of um, Kubernetes and cloud native environments, it's actually a daemon set. And then in case of bare metal VMs, it's actually a system D managed binary or a container. So it uses eBPF to provide security observability and then runtime enforcement. And then what's really important, it's transparent, so no change is required to your application. So we use eBPF to provide deep visibility. And then as you can see on the picture, we have visibility into process execution, system call activity, S3 f or connections, data access, file access, Linux namespace, and there's basically capability um, changes as well. What's also important that all the extensive internal filtering and aggregation, so all the business logic is, happen, is happening in kernel. So basically this leads us to low overhead regarding to CPU and memory, and then John will talk about it um, later. So all those observability events are exported to, to a file, to a JSON file, and you can integrate it with many CM systems, um, I listed some on the top, like Splunk, Elasticsearch, Sumo Logic. You could export it to S3 or like a blob storage. And then basically also, you can also use Grafana Loki um, as an integration. So why is it so powerful? So it provides really synchronous BPF monitoring, filtering, and enforcement completely with eBPF in kernel. There is also the overall efficiency of eBPS comparing to, for example, existing like user space tool or kernel modules. We also do like Kubernetes identity awareness with BPF. So you could create Kubernetes identity aware runtime security policies. We could monitor everything um, that, happen, that happens in the Linux kernel. And then basically we also do um, eBPS based inline enforcement in kernel rather than, for example, out of band. So that was a quick intro on Tetragon. So let's take a step back and think about like the history of Tetragon. So I will start from 2016. That was the year um, when the Cilium project launched as a CNI, providing eBPF based connectivity, observability, um, and security to the cloud native world. At 2018, Cilium reached 1.0, making the project available um, for uh, generic production users. And then in 2020, the first line of Tetragon were written, but actually not under the Tetragon name. So this was part of, initially part of the Cilium Enterprise code base, and then we had like a code name for it. It was called Hubble FGS. FGS stands for Fine Guidance Sensors. And then actually the first feature set was requested from a customer. It was a complex data analytics company. Um, I will talk about it later. But basically, um, they wanted to have observability into what's happening in their Kubernetes environment. They wanted to trace all the executables or the egress connections that um, leaving the cluster, and then basically trace every um, network socket. So after, 20, after 2020 and 2021, the first KubeCon talk happened um, about Tetragon, which basically included all, uh, also open source functionalities. And then since then, basically, we are at every KubeCon EU and then any um, 
I'm done presenting what have been working on. So we had talks about how can we create least privilege profiles, audit eBPF programs and maps, detect log for shell and the next CVs, the next CVs and then sensitive data patterns, for example, with KTLs. And then, so we still started to um, develop Tetragon, still under Cilium Enterprise. We had the L3L for connectivity, connectivity visibility, the L7 attributes, HTTP, DLS, TNS, uh, Linux capability and namespace changes. And then we got customers. So these were our like, first set of customers, the early adopters. I will also talk about it later. And then in 2022, so we decided to actually open source the project. So we renamed it to Tetragon and then make it open source. So actually the GitHub stars that you see on the, on the left side, that's actually what happened um, under 2022 um, EU in Valencia. So people like it gained a lot of traction. And then that was the time when actually the first blog post came out uh, about Tetragon. And that was the time when actually the first O'Reilly um, report came out on Tetragon. So if you want to get like an O'Reilly report, come to our booth, we will be handing out um, reports over there. And then, so in 2022, like our contributors, like open source contributors, users, and actually our engineering team grow because the initial set of, set of code was written by a very, very small people. And then basically we got the second set of customers who are kind of our like uh, mid-stage ad adopters. And then here we are 2023. So Tetragon just reached 1.0, making the project available for generic production users. So you can go to the, you can read the blog post. There is a blog post out about it. There is a press release about it. And then basically um, on the website, we have four main use cases, execution monitoring, uh, file access monitoring, network monitoring, and policy enforcement. And we have a set of like observability policies, um, but you can just like plug into your system and then um, try it out. So a few GitHub statistics. How many, I, so um, this is just pulled from the GitHub um, on the 1.0 release. And I, I think a couple of things really stand out. Um, there, even before the 1.0 release, we have 64 contributors. Uh, and what's really exciting is that um, there's actually more non-isovalent contributors at this point than isovalent contributors. So we have 23 folks from isovalent that are working on this at various times, apparently. Um, you know, the, Larger group of 38 here are not isovalent employees. So that's great um, from the product side or from the project side. Um, and then the other point here, we just sort of like, if you look at the patches per month and the PRs, like it's very active. There's a lot of stuff going on. We have 130 some odd patch, patches that are active right now. Um, we're merging patches, they're being open and closed. So um, definitely come to the GitHub page. Um, we like, you know, we have a bunch of first issues and stuff so you can. Uh, take a look and contribute. Cool. So what was actually the very first production use case? So this was coming from a, from a sophistic sophisticated data analytics company. And then basically they needed a cloud native or like Kubernetes identity of our solution to replace their traditional firewalls, traditional firewalls and network monitoring tools. So the, and also their EDR systems. So the problem here was that their network rules were based on IPs and ports and host names. And then these were not really useful in like containerized environments where IPs are frequently changing, pods come and go. And their endpoint detection and response tools suffer the same. So all of their alerts were based on IPs, ports and host names. And then the other problem was that every time they created a new resource, they, it had to have this EDR agent sending this telemetry to this centralized system. And then if you consider like a Kubernetes environment, that's not really like realistic either. So they wanted to create like an, an EDR or like a network monitoring tool, which was based on like Kubernetes identities, like labels, um, pod labels, namespaces, or um, for example, they wanted to trace API call identity. 
and then that's how that's how they implemented it. So they used Cilium for network traffic control. Um, they implemented Cilium network policies as L3, L4, and L7 in their Kubernetes infrastructure, and they used Tetragon as their observability and uh, logging platform. And then they, they wanted to have visibility into what's happening in their Kubernetes environment. And then this was basically an alternative um, to traditional enterprise EDRs. And then their alerting and detection engineers created signatures um, and then alerts to detect certain attack scenarios or malicious behaviors. They actually wrote a blog post, so I linked it. If you check the slides later, you can actually check it out how they implemented it. And then these were the very first initial Tetragon features. Trace every executables, trace every egress network connection with destination name, trace every open socket, and then store all this data in an S3 bucket for audit reasons. So where are they now? Um, they were actually the very first user of Tetragon ARM support. And then they are looking into file integrity monitoring and DNS drops as we speak. So they are still um, a very active uh, user of this. So who were kind of like the early customers that we have? So they all had a couple of things in common. So they all had like a stable backend system that they could store all this data like either um, Splunk, Elk, or S3, or they had their integrated pipeline into, um, into their security analytics platform. They were also comfortable creating and maintaining their own queries they were actually comfortable with custom, like customizing the filtering and aggregation. And they had people, they had like an engineering team who were um, who had actually operated and then deployed at Tetragon. I listed a couple of names here and logos. And then all the use cases were actually driven by them. So these were driven by customers. So for runtime security, they wanted to monitor all the executables for network security. They wanted to monitor all the network connections, DNS names, all the open network sockets. They wanted uh, DNS troubleshooting, figure out like which process or workload was responsible for DNS drops. And then file integrity monitoring, like monitor access to sensitive files or directories. And then also for the, for the enforcement and deployment use cases was also driven by them. So for enforcement, they wanted to have like Kubernetes identity aware security policies that allowed certain whitelisted system calls from pods or namespaces could drop certain Linux capabilities or block access to kernel host namespace, namespaces. And then for deployment, um, the ARM support and actually the standalone, the external VM installation was also driven by them. So a couple of signatures, like these are in, these are in Splunk, but this, this can be in Elasticsearch or like Rafa Analoki. The syntax would be different, but the idea is the same. So this is basically detecting workloads and processes with sudo, which started as root, or malicious shell execution, like someone keep cattle exact into the workload. Or we could detect like untrusted DNS names. So if you see some new DNS names that you haven't seen in the last week, that can be also interesting. Or detect outbound connections to non-standard ports, like something is connecting to port 80, or not port 80, or not 443. That can be also quite interesting. So these were the, the first set of customers. And then we had the second set of customers later on. So they had, they had a, common, um, a common aspect that they didn't have a stable backend system. So they didn't have like Splunk or Ag, or even if they did, like they didn't have the resources to manage or store the data, or these resources were actually limited. They didn't have, for example, a set of engineering team to actually operate Tetragon. And they were not really comfortable to create and actually maintain their own alerts or um, signatures. So they needed kind of like um, a security dashboard, like an out of the box dashboard um, that we could provide for them. So I put a couple of names here, um, there will be more coming. So I will show a couple of dashboards that we, we actually created for them. So the first is like detecting Linux namespace and um, previous changes. So for, so for example, Show me all the Kubernetes workloads that started with higher privileges or root access or gained later in the life cycle. Or show me all the Kubernetes workloads that started with 
kernel host namespace access or gained it later in the life cycle. And then this can be, for example, one dashboard. On the top, you can actually see the pods which started with um, higher capabilities. And then basically in the middle, you can actually see the JSON events in a table. So you could see like the source namespace, the source pod, all the capabilities that it had. And then on the bottom, basically these are the pods which had access to, for example, uh, kernel host namespaces like network or PID that it shouldn't have. The second is like file integrity monitoring. So this is basically a dashboard like um, showing sensitive files and directory access. So which binary pair from the operation, which application, which namespace, did it have uh, root access, which team was responsible for it. Another dashboard showing sensitive files, binaries that pair from the operation, all the JSON events um, in a dashboard. And then basically the last one is around Kubernetes data exfiltration. So we could answer questions like, which workloads send out the most egress traffic in the cluster? Is it even suspicious? If it's suspicious, like which process initiated it, which team, which workload, what was even the destination? So with this dashboard, we can actually track the top received bytes per pod and then the top outbound talkers. And then if we could investigate later, we could find out that, for example, Ubuntu and Nginx pod installed some libraries with APT. And then that's why it receives so many bytes. Or for example, there was like a logging agent sending out data to Splunk. So these were like the second set of customers. And then in... Sure, yeah. <laughs> so then um, the next kind of piece, we'll talk about some of the things we learned about writing eBPF uh, security tools. Um, and some opinions or, or principles, as we call them here, that we developed. So, so the first thing that we found out really early that was very powerful from a Tetragon side is to have most of the state that your security tool needs in the kernel itself. And so what this allows you to do is do really interesting mappings in the kernel, such as map all the files back to their binaries and map all the binaries back to their um, pod or their workload ID, which is kind of a generic version of a pod. Um, this lets you do that all inside the kernel, which means you don't have to send data up to user space, which allows kind of CPU performance reasons. That's really great. But also for enforcement. It means you can enforce, start enforcing things in the kernel. So by keeping the kind of a lot of the state that you need of your program inside the kernel in the eBPF, you get a kind of a big win in this ability to kind of link different operations inside the kernel that would otherwise not be um, you wouldn't be able to make these connections. For example, sockets are a good one, files are. If you want to know what binary is attached to what socket, it's just, is attached to what packet, you can make that entire chain, what, what uh, pod or label it has in a Kubernetes context. If you can do that all in the kernel, you're, you're off and running with a really good uh, base platform to start doing interesting things. Um, the next thing that we did um, that became apparent pretty quick is if you try to filter all of the events that a kernel is generating in user space, it's going to be very expensive. You're going to have to wake up user space every time you want it to tell it about a socket or every time you want to tell it about a file read, you're going to end up waking up user space. Every syscall, um, you're going to have to wake up user space. So kind of building on that first first point where we have all the context inside the kernel in BPF in Tetragon, we also added filtering in the kernel. And so what this allows you to do is say, actually, I don't want to really care about every read or I don't care about every socket. I only care about sockets that are outside of my cluster, for example. Maybe I trust this namespace. Any connections inside my namespace are fine. I just want to know about connections outside of my namespace. Or um, most of the reads inside my home directory, I don't need to monitor because the application can read its own data, but if it's going to try to write a file into the Etsy directory, or maybe it's going to try to write a file into user bin or slash temp, those are things that I want to alert on. And so what you've done is taken the case where you have to monitor everything, push the filters into the kernel, and now you're, now you're looking for things that are, that, are, that are important, that are rare or somehow significant. Um, and the value here is really, really quite significant because um, now you've removed that need to wake up user space all the time and start using lots of CPU. So you can do this kind of inline, inline in the kernel. Um, and then sort of as a technical corollary here is there's actually a buffer between the kernel and user space. And so now by pushing all of that data into the kernel, you relieve this extra interface um, that you now don't have to worry about drops on or overhead from. So 
kind of a secondary win to putting all that state into the kernel. Then you add filters, um, improves the system overall. Um, and then you can get kind of benchmarks like this, which are really um, what we shoot for in Tetragon. Um, on the one on the left, your left, yep. Um, we have the kernel build. So this is basically a stress test. And, and building a kernel on six, 16 cores, 32 cores, is actually a fairly good stress test because you're executing the compiler over and over again for every file in the Linux kernel. You're doing some uh, operation on it. You're opening and closing files. So there's a lot of actual work going on. Um, and what you can see on the left is, is no Tetragon running there with the 549.271 um, at the baseline. And then you can see with Tetragon, the overhead is really quite small, less than 2%. Um, so that's really great. And then if you add some additional JSON logging, it goes up to 2.5%. So that, that's if you want to export everything over JSON. So that's basically 1% of your CPU going to writing JSON files. But, um, but that's a, still a pretty good number, very minimal overhead. And then on the right side, what we're showing is if you want to report on, on certain files. So we found some files that we, we didn't think anyone should write to. Um, on a consistent, regular basis, you can think of, um, again, example would be, we don't expect our users to write into user sbin. Nobody should be writing new executables into my, bind, into my um, pod. Um, I don't expect people to execute on slash temp. That's usually some indication of something quite bizarre going on. And, and what we show is that if you, uh, on the left side, if you do kind of those first two principles we were talking about, put the state in the kernel, put the filtering in the kernel, the overhead is very minimal um, versus if you try to go to user space for everything, um, you get a much larger bar on the right there. So um, these are the kinds of things we're looking at with Tetragon um, from uh, observability and kind of security side. Um, the, next, the next point that we kind of came to the conclusion is that you can just monitor syscalls, but there's actually a lot more interesting stuff in the kernel than just syscalls. Um, you know, the syscalls are just the top layer that the user interface is with. If you want to know about the socket state, if you want to know about the TCP state machine, if you want to know what's going on in your networking and in the OS side, you really need to dig into the kernel. And so Tetragon has the ability to hook almost any function in the kernel. Um, syscalls included, but not limited to syscalls. And you also get a really nice benefit from that is um, a technical security reason we don't hook syscalls a lot of the times is the syscalls are using user data. You have a pointer to user data. And as a security tool, you just can't, can't trust user data um, in our model. So um, on the, that leads into this slide really quickly. So, You'll be really tempted um, when you're building your tool to do a lot of these things. Um, I know we were. U probes are super awesome. I, I love U probes, um, but as a security mechanism, they're just they're working over user data. So if your security model is to not trust your users, you're like, you don't trust the pod, for example, you really need to be careful when you're using U probes. Um, if you're not familiar, U probes let you hook user space basically instead of the kernel. But remember, that's that's user data. The user owns the data. They can work around your U-probe. They can change the data after you read it. Um, like I mentioned, syscalls there. And then the other one is the kernel has many, way, many ways to do the same thing. So if you think about syscall hooking, you can hook open, open at, every version of open that you can find in the syscall spec. Or you can hook fd install, which is the kernel's version of creating a file descriptor. And it's used once everywhere. <laughs> so. Um, this is just goes to the point that maybe hooking syscalls everywhere is not the best option. Usually, if you go into the kernel, you can find kind of the root, um, the root operator inside the kernel. Um, the next thing that I'll just mention that you get from this is by pushing all the states into the kernel, allowing you to hook outside of syscalls, is you get a really interesting story around enforcement. So rather than reacting, where you would say, I observed an event, sent the event up to user space, my logic in user space decides this is unacceptable, and then enforces by stopping the pod or stopping. The, that action may have already happened, right? You, it's kind of asynchronous to the system. Um, by pushing all of the state into the kernel, getting below the syscalls in many cases when you need extra data, um, you can enforce synchronously in line with the kernel. And this avoids a race, so you, the kind of um, most obvious case is somebody writes to a file. Right. You don't want to enforce that after the fact, after the file's been written to. You really want to stop the write from happening. 
Same way with networking. You don't want the network connect to happen and then some data to be exfiltrated and then sometime in the future you stop that from happening. You want to stop that before the data is even leaving the system. Okay. So we support um, a couple models around that. We actually support both models, by the way. Um, there's definitely use cases for reactive security as well. Um, but the enforcement is, is really the strong suite here for, for writing kind of Kubernetes native security policies. Um, so if we think about where we're heading in the future, um, I mentioned these policies. We, we put a few in for the 1.0 release, and um, they're on the web page. The folks are on the team here are working on putting a few more up there. That's just kind of the beginning. We have a lot of examples actually in the code itself, in the examples directory, um, but they're really um, cryptic, I would say. <laughs> you know, they were written by engineers. This is an attempt to kind of level that up a little bit so that users, kind of more of a user-facing policy library. Um, and what this would allow you to do is say, if you want to do, um, you want to monitor eBPF, there's a, there's a link to check, how do I monitor eBPF? And here's a file that I apply. Um, so it's to be very simple, quick to use, get some basic policies in place. Um, you see networking on outbound connections is at the bottom. I think I alluded to that one earlier. Um, some things that other folks are doing, um, not necessarily myself, um, we've seen some folks use Tetragon for S-bombs. Um, the idea being, uh, instead of using S-trace, you can use Tetragon. It gives you a lot more information than just syscalls. Um, for example, network connections, all this kind of data, you can roll that into an S-bomb. Um, we've seen a few folks use Tetragon to protect the system that's building SPOM, building the SPOM, to make sure that the SPOM integrity is, is intact. Uh, a couple of interesting use cases from that side that I hadn't uh, anticipated. Um, whoops. And we have a few dashboards. So there'll be more dashboards coming in the future. Uh, and Talia showed some of them. I don't think they're, um, I think they're on the web page, but probably not highlighted in the docs yet. Um, so in the code, but not in the docs. Um, and with that, um, we kind of covered all of this today, and here's how you can contribute. You can go to the GitHub page. Um, Natalia mentioned some of, like our, some of the people that are using Tetragon and their use cases. A lot of those actually come from pull requests. So if you, even if you aren't going to commit code, but you have a use case and you think it's interesting, create a pull request. We do read them. Um, it also allows other people to you know, see them and say, oh, that, I have that same use case too. Um, so we, we like that. Of course, if you want to contribute docs and examples and code, you know, we would, we would love it. Um, there's a bunch of first issue tags people can look at. Um, we've done a lot of work to get to 1.0, but there's just a ton more stuff to do that's super interesting. So come find me if you want to chat. Um, come to the booth, file a, go to the GitHub page and file a PR and whatnot. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have time for a few questions. I don't have a question, but I want to say big props for the tool that you built. Uh, I worked at Palantir, and I was one of the first people that rolled this out, like Hubble FGS Cilium inside uh -huh. Palantir, hey. why not? So nice. Thank nice. you. Nice. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, pretty interesting. Pretty complex to it. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, in the future, um, uh, would you consider having some sort of learning mode where you observe the behavior of applications and then that way you can construct automatically a policy yeah. for a? You know, yeah, yeah, a absolutely. It, it's come up a handful of times. It's you know, it's not in the one dollar release. Um, it's definitely something on a, that we've considered adding to the roadmap. Um, if we got some other folks to help work on it, we would be, you know, very enthusiastic. Um, but yeah, they, no, it makes a lot of sense because you, you see the, right now it's mostly done manually um, by the users, right? They get a right. pipeline of the observability. You have your security expert then read those and then they create the policy. Um, definitely that could mostly, maybe 90% of that could be automated, right? Or you can make a pretty cohesive policy just automatically from the, from the data. Right, right. What you have now is kind of more like a cluster-wide policy yeah. rather than a perhaps. Okay. Um, I, the, your SBOM was interesting. Uh, have you guys considered also container scanning as part of your offering? Or I know a lot of competitors are out there, so maybe it's not worth it. So like I add it to the container? As yeah, part if of the a container, container, once it comes in, you scan yeah. it, you know, make sure um, it's allowed to run. 
Right, yeah, so th there's been some talk about this where, um, you know, kind of part of the pod deployment would also pull in the Tetragon policy and they would come together. So you do a kubectl apply, you get the pod, you get the policy and the whole thing kind of goes out. Um, again, I, I kind of lump that in the same category as the automation. We got 1.0 out. I think we have all the fundamentals to do these kinds of things. And, you know, it's just a matter of getting, the, getting it on the roadmap and making it happen at this point. All right, thank you. Yeah, cool, thank you. I think both of those insights are kind of right on track with like where people are thinking about in terms of what to use Tetragon for. Okay, it looks like we don't have other questions. People are, people want to go to lunch. Yeah, it's lunchtime. <laughs>